go. Hello? Am I audible? Hello? Am I audible? Good morning and warm welcome to you all. I am Vaibhav, your host for today. Our topic for today is FEMA and taxation in everyday scenario for individual and businesses. It shall be taken by Miss Meera Joshua. She shall be covering laws that every NRI should know. Laws that every business is having cross-border transaction should know, followed by basic insights on ODI and FDI, followed by question and answer session. Our agenda for today is 
virtual inauguration by Dr. Sundar Kataria, invoking the blessing of deity, chanting of Gayatri Mantra. Introduction of speaker, presentation by Ms. Meera, question and answer session, and last closing session. About the Sadgun Sang, Sadgun Sang is conceived and led by Dr. Sundar Kataria, driven with the mission to elevate the quality, safety, and environmental awareness levels of industry. Sadgun Sang is a series of educative, informative events aiming to eliminate professionals on possible solutions to current issues of industry and economy. About Dr. Sundar Kataria, designation and organization, Chairman and Managing Director, International Certification Services Private Limited. His academic qualification are Doctorate in Business Management, followed by Mechanical Engineer. Dr. Kataria have experience in Rajasthan Atomic Power Project, India's first nuclear power plant, RAPP, at Ravadbata, Kota, built by Indian engineer. Work as a nuclear scientist for 11 years and successfully completed and commissioned the plant. Engineers India Limited, first batch of engineers to develop Bombay High Offshore Oil and Gas Fields, Mega Offshore Complex Platform, Trunk and Submarine Pipelines, Underwater Inspection and Indigenization Oil and Gas Equipment, etc. Dead Norsec Versatile's World Largest Classification Society. Worked for 17 years at various capacity for the certification of fixed offshore installations, submarine pipelines, onshore projects, and personnel qualification. ICS. He is founder of India's first certification conformance assessment body established in the year 1999. Provider of total quality solution. Certification of management system, ISO inspection, testing, and training qualification of personnel. His achievements and awards are Receive Lifetime Achievement Award for the contribution for the corrosion technologies from NES International by NIGIS under NES USA. Social Worker, Protection of Life, Asset, Environmental and Safety. In today's session, we have Dr. Kataria. I request Kataria, sir, to please say a few things about today's webinar. So please welcome Kataria, sir. Thank you, Vabhuji. Thank you, thank you. Very good morning to Ms. Meera Jaisar. And I would also like to thank Dr. Kishore for introduction of Meera to this Sadgur Sangmeet. Welcome. Ms. Veera, as well as the delegates to this virtual meet, which we have been conducting for last two and a half, three years almost. And we have very eminent personalities, eminent speakers coming from various fields, from India as well as overseas. We are lucky today to have Ms. Veera Oshar, who is going to speak on FEMA and the taxation law. As you know, India has been very pragmatic and going to be the fifth largest economy in the world. From three million US dollar, we are going to go to five million trillion US dollar by the year 2047. So even our RBA and finance ministry has been very pragmatic and provide a lot of support a lot of foreign exchange and FDI also has been there. There are direct investment also coming to India in millions of dollars every year. Our foreign reserves also increase drastically. So I will not talk much on this. And uh, I will hand over to our expert, our Ms. Bira, talk on the FEMA and the taxation law especially for individual as well as businesses. Today, a lot of NRI also there who are settled abroad and also has been putting a lot of uh, foreign exchange to India. 
So what are the taxation law? Because there's a lot of reform has been made and we have to keep ourselves updated with the laws time to time in order to avoid any problems or any fine on us for not knowing the law. Thank you very much. I'll hand over mic to Miss Meera. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request Secretary Sir to please virtually inaugurate the session. Please join us for the recitation of the Gayatri Mantra. So now we would like to introduce our today's keynote speaker, Ms. Meera, designation and organization, senior partner at RC, RC Jain and Associates LLP. Her academic qualification are Chartered Accountant FCA, deep in IFRS, become Bachelors of Commerce. Certification in an intensive course for service tax, her area of specialization and experience, statutory assurance and risk advisory, international taxation and cross-border advisory, structural planning, serving WIRC and ICAI as moderator, speaker, technical reviewer, judge for, for debates, mentor, etc. for various sessions, courses. Member of Core Committee of Well CA, Women Entrepreneurs Learn to Lead, BCAF, Bhanushali Chartered Accountants Forum, Invitee Member at WYMEC, ICAI, etc. Please welcome Meera, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And thank you, Kataria, sir, for uh, your warm words. Uh, taking forward the session, can I share my screen now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Just a sec, bear with me for a minute.
Yeah, we are ready. I hope you all are able to see my screen. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. See, today what we are going to concentrate on as such international taxation, if I talk about or if I talk about FEMA, it runs into a very big course in itself. I definitely cannot teach you all FEMA or international taxation in the next one, one and a half hour, which is allotted to me. But I will try to uh, give justice to the fact that, uh, as I see, the Institute ICS is providing international certification services, wherein definitely uh, the participants, the students who are taking up these services are somewhere or the other touching cross-border transactions. They are going abroad, they are coming back. In today's uh, daily life, FEMA and international taxation is something which we should know like our regular activity. We always think about this FEMA or international taxation as a very specialized subject, which only a very specialized person should be knowing. But I feel uh, if these basic insights are known by everyone, Definitely, it will help them in your day-to-day -day, uh, migration in and out, sending money, receiving money, doing regular business activities. So that is something which we will concentrate today upon. What we will take up in the session. We'll be covering uh, what is capital account and current account transactions, inflow and outflow of money from India, whether there are something known as automatic routes, approval routes, reporting formalities upon certain investments that we make or certain annual compliances that we are required. But what we will do is we'll bifurcate the session between two. One is the individuals and one is the companies. Uh, I will spare around 60 to 70% of the time on the individual side because uh, what I find is today's participants, this is something which will be far more usable and 30 to 40 percent on the corporate side. The corporate FEMA and international taxation is so huge that if I even spare 100 percent, it won't be enough. So definitely I'll try to uh, concentrate on individuals more. And if required, we can take up a more detailed session on the corporate in upcoming sessions. Um, these are certain areas that I'm going to cover. I'm not reading them all out because definitely these are there in my upcoming uh, uh, slides. These are the topics that I am planning to cover under the corporate uh, section. Now, the most important under my FEMA or international taxation is to understand financial year, to understand residency because my entire taxation revolves around the word residency. If I am resident in India, my taxations are in X format. If I am not a tax a resident in India, my taxation are in a different format. Something which is will be taxable in India, something which is not. So to decide residency, the primary factor is the financial year. Normally what we talk about 1st April to 31st March every year is a particular financial year. Say 1st April 2023 to 31st March 2024 is the current financial year that is running. Right. Now, under FEMA, this uh, financial year is nowhere determined. But what we generally assume is under income tax, this is April to March. And under FEMA, we presume it is April to March to bring it in line with the tax issue. Now, the residency primarily depends on the number of days you are physically present somewhere. See, presently, I need to stress upon the word physical is because sitting in India, I can do work for the entire globe today, right? Virtual is nothing which is uncommon today. If I was talking of 20 years earlier, maybe a virtual presence somewhere else would not be a very common factor. But today, everyone knows virtual presence is very common. Today, we do all activities sitting at any part of the world and actually performing their activity in the other part of the globe. Right? But my taxation will depend upon my physical presence. If under income tax, if I am physically present, in India, for example, for more than 182 days, that is 183 and beyond, 
then I am resident in India. But under FEMA, it is different. It is 180. The difference is of one day. For you and me, it will not be that material. But someone who is on a borderline case, it is important for him or her to know the difference of 180 to 183 days. Commonly, I will say, if one figure is to be kept in your brains, you should always think about being in India for more than 182 days. Then he's resident. If it is less than or up to 182 days, he's a non-resident. Secondly, the difference between residency under the Income Tax Act and the FEMA Act is Income Tax Act purely goes by the physical presence. And those 182 days, there are some 60 days, 120 days also being spoken about. We'll come to that in the upcoming slides. But today, now if I'm concentrating on 182 days, I say income tax is very strict on 182 ke either hai to non-resident, either hai to resident. But when it comes to FEMA, FEMA is more purpose driven. I mean, suppose I am going out of India with a notion or with a uh, willingness that I will be working outside India or living outside India for my life or I'll be living outside India for the next five years, next two years. If that is the purpose with which I am leaving under FEMA on day one, I become a non-resident and my FEMA regulations, which is a very big and a complicated act, so-called complicated act, revolves on all those provisions applied to me right from the day I'm leaving India. But under income tax, all these will apply only after 182 days. And that to that 182 days is a financial year. Suppose I'm going out somewhere in January, right? Till June and I am outside India, more or less 182 days are covered. Do I become a non-resident? No, because Jan to March, I am not outside India for 182 days. So, I become a resident. April to June, again, I am not outside India for more for 182 days. So, I still become a resident in India because I am in India for more than 182 days. Presuming that after coming back in uh, first week of July, I am not going out. So, one, 182 days. Second, it should be within the financial year. It can be in breaks. In the month of April, I went out, I came back in May, then I went back in June, I came back in July. But the total number of days when I calculate and total up, they are crossing 180 today, I become non-resident. Right? I mean, uh, they are uh, crossing 182 days in India, I am resident. If I am outside India 182 days, I am a non-resident. But as I told you, my FEMA guidelines, I will come to... I mean, uh, in the upcoming slides, you will come across certain clauses which are FEMA driven, some which are purely taxation driven. So anything which is FEMA driven, if I say I am very clear, I am making some declarations or I, it is on the inception, it is very clear that I'm going to be outside India for these 182 days and beyond, I become a non-resident from day one and I need to follow all these compliances from day one. And uh, very frankly, see, uh, whatever slides I'm covering up, it will be more like as an individual who is moving out and in, we need to know these so that we can plan better. Right? This is what I was talking about. The residence. Section 6 under the Income Tax Act is the one which governs it. If I am in India for more than or equal to 182 days, I am a resident. Right? But if I am in India for less than 182 days, then I need to have two, three other criteria checked. One is, I am in India for less than 60 days in India. Because after going down from 182 days, I have two other criteria to be checked. Whether I was in India for 9 out of 10, I mean, I was in India for at least 60 days. If I am less than 60 days, suppose I am in India for 70 days, I have one more rule to check. Whether in the past four years, 
in totality in year 1 2 3 and 4 whether i was in india at least for a total of 365 days if yes then i become a resident but if i am in india for less than 60 days then i am pure pure non resident not looking at any other kind of condition so more than 182 days i am pure resident Less than one, less than 60 days under any conditions, I am a non resident. Now, the picture all revolves are between 60 days and 182 days. Again, uh, for example, I told you if I am in India for 70 days, and this is the first time I've gone outside India. So, in the previous four years, I was in India only, means I was in India for three, more than 365 days, right? In such a scenario, I still become a resident in spite of me being outside India for 70 days and things like that. Secondly, but if I'm going out for employment or profession, I mean, employment can be your business, it can be a job, it can be your own uh, research. I mean, something which is related to you earning your daily uh, bread and butter. Then I still stick to 182, less than 182 and more than 182. Then 60 does not come into picture. And with effect from financial year 2021, there is one more clause that has come in that I am in India for say 140 days. In the previous four financial years and all that, I was not resident. But my income in India is more than 15 lakhs. You would have heard of people who just keep on hop and jump. For two months, they are in Dubai. Two months, they are in US. Two months, they are in UK. Four months, they are in India. Then they go to China. They go to Hong Kong. At the end, what happens is they don't become resident of any of the country going by this because by and large, the 60, 182 and whatever days I'm talking about remain near about the same in every country. Right? So, if I am in six different countries, just staying there for two, two months, I am not resident in any of the countries. And my taxation is all related to residency. So if I am not resident in any country, means I don't have to pay tax anywhere. It is such a good thing, no? And people are actually doing that. So government has come up, the income tax department has come up this new clause, which talks about an Indian citizen who's going outside India, doing this hopping and jumping, resulting in not being a resident in any of the country. Means he wants to now avoid his taxation everywhere. So government says nothing doing. If you are doing this hopping and jumping, you are my citizen. You will have to come and pay taxes to me for the entire income of the entire globe. So this is this one clause which we are talking about. However, if this is a small person having a passive income of 1-2 lakhs and something in India, again, this does not attract. It attracts if your income in India is more than 15 lakhs. Okay? I know how much ever I explain you, this slide is really going to go add more and more complication in your brain. Even after practicing so many years, every time someone approaches us to say whether I'm a resident, let me know. They narrate their days and etc. I'm like, please hold on. Let me chalk it down. Let me see which clause it is coming to. Only then I'll be able to let you know whether you're a resident or non-resident. So if you are going out, coming back, and this residency thing is really uh, important for you, please chalk it down. Ensure your residency because my entire taxation, which we'll be discussing in the upcoming slides, will depend on where I am resident at. Right. There is also this concept of not ordinary. We heard about resident. We heard about not resident. And this is something in between. Not ordinarily resident. <coughs> Suppose I am resident. Okay. In the current year. Means actually that I have to offer my entire income in India. Blah, blah, blah. But. I was a non-resident for the last nine years out of the 10 years. Means I was abroad. I was working there. This is the first year I have come back. Then department gives me a, a shield that I will can still be considered as a not ordinarily resident. This is, this is the middle terminology. Or, I mean, 
any one of the two conditions if you satisfy one is that out of the preceding 10 years 9 years you were a non resident second is you were in india for less than 729 days in the ten, entire seven you kept on coming and going you counted the number of days and your number of days are say 720 right you still become a not ordinarily resident so we discussed about a resident we discussed about being non-resident and this is a third not ordinarily resident i will come to the slide why i am talking about these three bifurcations specifically this is basically why i'm talking about these three things any income received or is deemed to receive in india either by the person himself or on my behalf someone else if i am an ordinary resident then that entire amount is taxable in india and this is something if i have actually received the money in india my income in india i'm not talking about money the income in india then whether i am an ordinary resident i am a not ordinary resident or a non resident entirely every category taxability will be in india an income which accrues or arises or is deemed to accrue or arise outside india oh, no, sorry first is whether it's received and second is whether it is accrued or deemed to accrue or arise in india now i will uh, give you an example of the first one received in india suppose i am uh, working outside india right my physical presence is outside india i am a non resident clear cut non resident and my employer whether it is an indian employer or it is a foreign employer the income he is giving to me is in my ba indian bank account or he is giving to my uh, husband my wife my brother my sister my mother some of someone who is receiving this money on my behalf right so this is income received or deemed to be received in india on my behalf or by myself or on my behalf then even if i am outside india i am a non resident i am actually working also abroad but the money is the income is received in india it is still taxable in india so that is why generally we say that if you are going abroad open a bank account there and get your monies in that bank account don't get your money by any chance in a bank account in india second is accrue or deem to accrue or arise in india i have gone outside india i am working there but my indian employer has sent me outside india in the background what he does he has not stopped my basic he tells i'll continue to give your basic even if you are outside india so this amount he has not actually paid he is just collecting it in my name he will pay to me when i am in india but he is claiming in his expense this is something which has already been allocated for me in my name so it means it has accrued in india right in such a case also whether i am an ordinary resident not ordinary resident or a non resident it will still remain taxable in india now third is where income which accrues or arises to him outside india i am working outside india i am staying outside india my employer is giving me my salary my remuneration everything outside india so it has been received outside india it is accrued around outside india in such a case if i am an ordinary resident i mean i am generally situated for two months i was sent for a project outside india for those two months the money also was received for received outside india that employer gave me the money there only in my bank account say in us they have not given it to me in india but it accrued and arise also outside india but if under my income tax rules the residency 182 days all that and i become a resident an ordinary resident then even if this money belongs to my work outside india received outside india it will still be taxable in india right so i will say are that person has already charged taxation or that country has already charged taxation on it why should i be penalized for it we'll come to what will be what are the kind of benefits we can get under this where there is there are double taxation but 
under the income tax law if i am an ordinary resident my entire income is taxable in india if i am a non resident pure pure non resident then it is not taxable in india because i am working outside received outside india accrued outside india it is outside the picture of indian jurisdiction of the indian irs now this nor which i am talking about no i was outside india for 9 years 15 years i have come to india today. suppose i become a resident today and somewhere in the month of december okay in the month of december if i am becoming a matlab coming to india i am still like the under the 60 days etc and i become an ordinary i become a resident what will they tell me even for the first 10 months that you were in london you have earned the income pay taxes on it in india it is burden on me right so i have this concept of not ordinary resident if i am not an ordinary resident then only from jan to march whatever i earn whatever accrues arises in india will be taxable in india for the first 10 month which was accrued arise received outside india during my working outside india will not be taxable in india so that is why it is very important for us to understand this concept of nor this is helpful especially for the people who are coming becoming indian resident after a long stay outside it got it and that is basically having understood i need to plan my uh, visit outside or in india firstly check the purpose i told you because under fema i told you that even if i am going out today with an intention and a clear guideline that i am not going to come back to india for the next 5 years my employment document talks about it or whatever xyz i am going there for education for 5 years they i have those uh, paperwork everything when i'm going from india i've received a visa based on that i've taken loan based on that i have submitted the documents right so in those cases frankly i become a non resident on day one so under fema there are concept of uh, closing your regular bank accounts opening nro nre accounts not investing in india and this and that all those start up becoming applicable to you today so generally we talk about whenever we are going out this purpose thing should be by and large kept very general so that we can play around with the income tax provisions for those 182 days 60 days and all that right such that i try to fit myself in the in the non resident or a uh, nor category in such a way that only the income which is actually received or accrued in india becomes taxable in india my rest of the global income is not brought to indian jurisdiction because i tell you there are concepts of this double taxation avoidance agreements and all that but at the end the ssc is not far to benefited out of it many a times you still end up paying excessive taxations double taxations right so it is important for me to know the purpose i should check out the purpose i should try to keep it as general as possible wherever i am disclosing my purpose of going out i should say i am going out if i am not able to gel in if i am not able to figure out my work out there i might come back in two months so keep it open don't underline your stay outside india for a long period second check the income in india suppose you are going out you are going to stay there for 2 years 4 years etc and you know that in india you are not going to otherwise work or have any other active income but the passive income also keeps on being taxable in india and then when you are outside india the way i am talking about 182 days a residency in india there are a similar concept of residency in any country that you suppose you become a resident of usa usa is a very ruthless country usa says if you become my resident wherever you earn the income wherever whatever being doing everything i will bring to tax in my country we really dream of going to us and everything but then this is practically a fact even if you never visit india nothing is brought from india to us nothing no money has come nothing etc but still if there is even a single rupee of income in india 
the us people will ask a declaration about it and they will ask you to pay taxes on it right and there are adverse effects of the double taxation not being able to claim in toto so that is the reason what we say is check what income you have in india this last thing plan to transfer the assets to another in case it is felt necessary generally you have it is very common nowadays even when you are studying in your college you have your demat accounts you have shares right now there's those shares will passively earn dividend for you suppose you are going out and you are still trading on the market you are allowed not allowed i'll come to that but if you are still trading you will have capital gains you have certain property in india inherited property purchased property right you will earn rent on it all this income is taxable in india because as per indian tax rules it is accrued arrived or received in india blah blah so in india definitely they are going to be taxed but they will also be taxed in us so that generally whoever is moving out we suggest that you all transfer your assets to your near dear ones transfer it to your parents gift it to them before going because after going again then the power of attorney Uh, you whatever this power of attorney if at all you need to go and make in us the cost will be 10 to 20 times you need to go to the indian embassy out there do an apostille for every paper apostilled by them they charge in dollars right so the cost you can imagine so plan yourself make a proper general complete in depth detailed power of attorney before you go out give it to your mother father brother sister any blood relative whatever assets you have transfer it to them i will suggest transfer it to them if you really have a long term goal of stay, staying abroad right then in the year when you are moving out and in the check out the rule of other countries where you are moving for example the other country has a rule of 150 days and we have a rule of 180 days every country has different few days here and there are there, there in different countries you might end up become resident in both the countries right the problem arises then what will happen if you are a resident of india you need to offer your global income to indian jurisdiction if you are an uh, resident of hong kong you will have to offer your global income as uh, income of hong kong under the uk uh, hk jurisdiction and the double taxation benefits as i told you are not too friendly so you end up end up paying extra taxes so whenever you are going out or coming to in india mid of the year please check out your residency dates ensure that you become a non resident in one country and a resident in any one country don't end up becoming a resident in two different countries it is very important people don't understand this but then they end up paying shelling out extra money please be careful and plan your days of staying outside or in india during those periods this applies when you're going out this applies when you're coming in even within the year if you keep on coming to india or going out frequently the number of days needs to be taken care of right now if i talk about now you've become a non resident theek hai considering the 182 days all calculations we did we made proper planning and you have become a non resident now i always think in the entire globe maximum returns which i can earn is in india it is a fast growing economy today india is giving you returns which no other country is giving you right so what do you want to do you want to earn in us but invest in india how can you invest i told you one thing before going gift out your properties and x and y agreed this is true so long as you don't want to earn from properties in india if you are sure i don't mind paying taxes and i can manage the taxes and still on a very good amount of income because for example if i talk about developed countries uk us till 10 years ago they used to give zero returns on your investments the economy was running on expenditure you expend as much as possible they did not offer any amount if your saving account has huge amounts if you have make fds you do anything even your property uh, investment yielded you bare rate of returns so what people used to very generally do is transfer the money to india 
purchase a property, make investments in share market, etc. So under FEMA, a non-resident is allowed if he is of Indian origin. Non-resident, if I am talking about a UK citizen and a non-resident residency uh, uh, checkings, if we are doing, the rules are different from him. But if I am a person of Indian origin, PIO, or an overseas citizen of India, that is, I am a UK citizen, but initially, I, myself, my parents, my uh, grandparents, they were uh, Indian residents, and based on that, I receive an OCI card, right? In such a case, I have better, I'm in a better position to make investments in India. Just that there are certain repatriation restrictions, but an NRI can make what kind of uh, investments in India. The first is property purchase. Yes, he can purchase both residential and commercial properties, but not agricultural land. Agriculture, banking, finance sector, these are some very common no-no for any country. An outsider, I am talking of NRI, although I tell he is an Indian, but now he has become an outsider. So, he cannot purchase agricultural. Yes, he can inherit it. My parents have some property. I am an NRI. It comes to me in inheritance. I can hold it. I can sell it. But I cannot purchase a new agricultural land which never originally belonged to me or my ancestors. Right? So, I, as an NRI, I can purchase both residential and commercial properties but not agricultural land. The purchase proceeds can be out of Indian money or it can be out of foreign remit. However, per, I mean, and this purchase can be done either personally, I should come to come here, make the signatures, do the registration, or it can be done through a power of attorney. As I told you, that is why it is important that you have a power of attorney in place before you go out. Every single day in India, I need to purchase, open a DMAT account. I am not in India. Who will do it? So my POA has to do it. I need to purchase, sell, uh, put on rent, any property, etc. Who will do it for me? The POA holder. I need to open a new bank account. I need to shift the bank account. I need to make an FD. For every thing which I am not physically present, I get stuck up if I don't have a POA in place before I'm leaving. Yeah. So this document is something and we feel that may go to a lawyer, get a very nice POA drafted and get it registered in India. Your entire including a legal expert who will draft it for you, your entire cost will be less than 10,000 rupees. Mostly by between 5 to 7,000 rupees, it will be done. Same thing if you need to do sitting in US, UK, Australia, New Zealand, this will run to 50,000, 70,000. Right? So choice is your. Now I can purchase the property either personally or through a POA. And the benefit of foreign remittance. Benefit of foreign remittance, I talk about when I uh, talk about remitting this property abroad. Sale of property also, it can be freely done. All types of properties, commercial or uh, residential, even agricultural, which I inherit, I can sell. Remittance of the property proceeds. I can remit all amounts brought through, uh, brought through inward remittance. Suppose I purchase a property of 1 crore. And to purchase that one crore property, I brought this one crore from London. I had remitted it in. I made the payment to the builder. Or I had taken a home loan and the EMIs were paid from a foreign fund. So this is money remitted in India. So when I am selling the property, say for one crore, 20 lakh rupees. So the one crore which I am talking about can be freely, freely repatriated because this had actually flown in India from outside India. So there are no restrictions for taking back that money. Now the 20 lakhs of profit, which I'm talking about, that 20 lakhs can be taken outside India n number of times if I am selling a commercial property. But if I'm selling uh, residential property, this can be taken out for only two residential properties in my entire life. Means I am purchasing a property, making profit, purchasing another property, making profit. So long as everything remains in India, no problem. But suppose I purchased a property. I earned this 20 lakhs. I took it outside India. Next time again, I want to purchase another residential property. I brought in money from outside India. I This time I earned a profit of 70 lakh rupees. I took it outside India. Third time when I'm purchasing the uh, residential property, 
now i can not take any profit out of that outside india under the fema rules there are practical loopholes which banks don't check and they are allowing some banks are very strict in checking this and they don't allow some banks don't understand this and they are not adequately equipped with this kind of mechanism then they allow everything but why take the risk so in such a situation what you should do if yeah but firstly either go for commercial properties n number of commercial properties you can buy and sell buy and sell and take money outside india or purchase the property residential property entire reinvestment thing which you are talking about keep on doing it in india now if you feel there is a sizable profit in many of the uh, residential property and you need money outside india then for that big property or that big uh, profit which you have made take it outside india so that will be counted as one you still will have one more for your lifetime right and remittance of sale proceeds ha huh. there is another catch in it generally what happens is when i am talking about ki i cannot remit more than two properties ka profit outside india or there are other remittances also which are not permitted for example if i take a loan in india i cannot remit outside india i have to use it in india however there is a concept of 1 million usd 1 million usd is 10 lakh usd in a year which i can take outside india from the assets which i have in india whatever i have it in bank account i had a property which i sold and now money is received i had kept in shares now i received it fd was there pf was there whatever all these amounts which are my assets in india now i want to take outside india every year 1 million usd is what you can take outside india and 1 million usd does not mean you only need to take out in dollars suppose you are going to china right the chinese yen equivalent of 1 million usd can be taken outside india if you are doing it in pounds pound equivalent of 1 million usd can be taken outside india swiss franc 1 million usd worth of swiss francs can be taken outside india however when you are talking about property purchase there are certain restrictions with regards to td i would not say restrictions even if you know when we are selling a property in india you are subject to 1% tds right yeah so but that is under section 194 ia but when a property is sold by an nri the tds will not be under section 194 ia at the rate of 1% it will be under section 195 and the percentage actually is not defined it is actual taxes that are required to be discharged needs to be deducted but practically the problem is the buyer will say why should i do the calculations of your profit and your capital gains and then determine what is the taxation on that one i don't know whether your documents are correct uh the calculation requirements something will be allowed by the department something will not be allowed the indexation which you are calculating or maybe i am not equipped for making those calculations so what the buyers commonly do when they purchase a property from an nri is 20% plus surcharge and cess anywhere in the range of 23 to 26% depending on what rate of surcharge is applicable is what they deduct out of the total sale value of the property if i am selling a property worth 2 crores 20% of it which means 23% if also if i talk about somewhere around 43 44 lakhs is what they deduct as tds suppose you had not made profits you are actually making losses in that transaction still 40% of tds will be deducted by the buyer buyer paid in your name to the income tax department then you file your income tax return and you can claim the entire money back 40 lakhs will be uh, blocked up for somewhere around 1 to 3 years right so be clear when you are an nri and you are selling any property ensure that you go for something known as the lower tds tds can be obtained under section 197 a lower tds wherein the seller approaches his jurisdictional income tax officer he submits all the papers based on that the uh, income tax officer 
will make assessment of what are taxes that he actually needs to discharge on this transaction and what is the percentage of tax which the buyer then needs to deduct based on these calculations and in no case it is coming to 20% of the sales value generally what it comes to 0.5% 0.1% 1% 3% so imagine where on a 2 crore property something like if i get a 1% then what will be required is only 2 lakh of tax holding as against that 42 lakhs were earlier hit don't do that mistake you feel it is a cost because this cost will run somewhere in the range of 50000 to 1 lakh rupees considering the professional fees and everything but it is still worth it because your money of 40 lakhs now are not blocked for 1 to 3 years got it so be careful when you are selling your property as an nri TDS and if I am a resident who is buying from an NRI, I need to ensure that I deduct taxes at 23% of the sales value. I pay it under section 195 and not under section 194 IA. Got it? In under section 194 IA, the TDS is generally required to be deducted by the 30th of the next month. But under 197, it is 7th of the next month. So again, I need to be careful if I am purchasing a property from an NRI. I need to ensure I pay my TDS by the 7th of the next month. A quarterly return is required to be filed. And I need a TAN, unlike uh, Section 194 IA, where no TAN is required. And in Form 26 QB, you can just file a return come Chalan and you can submit. In case of an NRI transaction, that will not be the case. The buyer will need a TAN. He will need to uh, deposit the TDS by the 7th of the next month, file a return for it. And if no lower TDS is there, the tax applicable is almost 23% plus on the total sales value. Don't, uh, I mean, see, I would say logically it should be after making all the calculation what the department is doing. But as a buyer, if there is any short deduction, the department will not go to the seller to ask for additional taxes. They'll come to the buyer because the seller is a non-resident. He is residing outside India. The jurisdiction officer does not have jurisdiction on that person. He has jurisdiction on you and you will be the person who will be held behind for this. Okay. Similar provisions are there in case of property rentals also. An NRI can provide his property. He can put out his property on rent. But as I told you, here, there for property purchase, the TDS was under section 194IA. For rental, it is 194IB. It, it is a resident to resident. The landlord is resident. The, land, the person who is occupying the property is a resident. But if I am taking a property on a rent from an NRI, I need to deduct taxes under section 195 and not 194IB. The taxes will be 30% plus surcharge and says and not the 5% which generally we deduct. So be very careful. Don't end up deducting less taxes. The TDS is to be paid the 7th of the next month and not 30th. You will need to take a TAN and your return will not be under 26 QC. There will be a separate quarterly return that will be. And in this case also, if he does not want to get it deducted at 30% or if you are an NRI and you don't want to get your uh, rental TDS to be deducted at 30%, you can apply for lower TDS under 197. Now, if my client is an NRI and he approaches me for a lower TDS for purchase of property, I am more than happy to suggest, yes, you should do it. But if he approaches me to uh, get a lower TDS for a rental transaction, I suggest don't do it. Reason being, this sub, uh, certificate is received for a year. If you are receiving a rent of 40,000, 50,000, even if my 30% is retained by them under TDS provisions and it is paid on my behalf, my blockage of funds will be 2 lakhs, 3 lakhs, right? Which I will get in a year's time or two years' time. But if I am going for a lower TDS certificate, my cost to obtain that is 50,000 or 70,000. So there is, if I talk about return versus the cost, in case of a rental property, taking a lower TDS certificate is not that recommended. Unless the property is of a huge value, you are earning a rental of 5 lakh rupees, then 30% means every month 1 lakh 50,000 rupees in 
12 months it is 18 lakh rupees being blocked yes definitely going for a lower tds is preferable but not otherwise now people talk about whether an nri can invest in india under shares mutual funds government bonds etc 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 yes you are allowed you can firstly hold all your shares which you otherwise had owned it before going out before you were an nri or you have inherited from someone you can hold that you can further purchase and sell the shares or mutual funds but you cannot do that in the open market reason being under the fema law if any company has to take funds from an nri they have to follow certain guidelines right to follow those guidelines they need to know that the investor is an outsider if you do it in an open market will the company ever know that you are an outsider and the investor is an outsider so there is a concept known as pmis portfolio management investment scheme so you can acquire and sell the shares on the share market only through the pmis because this category uh, accounts are monitored by the banks and the necessary information is passed on to the rbi to the sebi and to the investee companies wherein they can follow their compliances with regards to foreign investment so don't continue your demat account which you otherwise held earlier okay also investment in mutual fund dated government securities other than the bearer securities treasury bills unit of mutual domestic mutual fund all all this is allowed if purchasing through stock market then do it under pis or do it a direct investment from the company government bonds go purchase it from the government it is okay but if you are doing it from the stock market do it under the portfolio investment scheme intraday trading fno and all that is generally not allowed fno they say is allowed but there are restrictions on that also so be careful while you do any kind of intraday trade now coming to this dt double a which i am talking about for quite some slides these are agreements entered between india and most of the countries in the world they are bilateral agreements wherein what they agree upon is if there is income which i am taxing then you don't tax on it if you have to tax i will not tax and can i do that mutually at every transaction i talk to us are ye tum mat tax karna ye mujhe de do nahi ye main nahi karunga chal ye tum kar lo this cannot happen right so that these are pre decided it is a list of with every country these comprehensive agreements run in 8 to 10 15 pages depending upon the country and the complexities they have outlined what kind of income are taxable in which country to read this document itself is a havoc but yes this exists but if i just uh, sum it up the rules say that the any income will either be taxed in x country or y country it should not be taxed in both the countries. but still we end up with instances where incomes are taxed in both the countries so what the country says is if i am a resident of india and certain income has been taxed in us but i also have to offer it in india global taxable right i have to offer in india what i should do there is a mechanism whereby i need to say this is the indian taxes finally paid to be paid on this income which was for, which is, has come from outside india on this y is something which was already deducted by us so only if there is any additional taxation then i will pay in india if you has has this deducted more taxes then i don't pay up any additional tax in india and that is the calculation under section 89 90 91 these are certain relief sections but practically what happens same is there opposite also suppose i am a us resident i have earned an in indian income in india i need to offer it there i can take benefit of taxes which i have paid in india and so it looks and sounds very beautiful that i'll never have to pay double taxation but i'll just give you examples i had a property in india which i put out on rent 
ठीक है सो इन इंडिया वेन आई पुट आउट प्रॉपर्टी ऑन रेंट ऑफ सेल वन लैख रुपीज थर्टी परसेंट ऑफ दैट इज प्रिज्यूम्ड टू बी द एक्सपेंडिचर ऑन मेंटेनेंस और रिपेयर एक्सेट्रा एक्सेट्रा और स्टैंडर्ड डिडक्शन ऑफ थर्टी परसेंट इज अलाउड सो ओनली सेवेंटी परसेंट इज टैक्सीबल on which i will make the calculation interest benefit is given and based on that i will uh, come upon a tax and discharge the tax if i go to us there is no concept of 30% deduction so us will take the income to be 1 lakh rupees <coughs> charge 30% 40% whatever is their rate come to a calculation from that whatever amount of tax is paid in india will be deducted and rest additional taxes i'll have to pay in us property transaction related only one more complication which we come across is uh, this property in india gets indexation benefits after indexation benefits you might end up not paying any taxes in india but in uk us uh, france all these developed countries they don't have the concept of indexation because they never had inflation in all this year so there was no no cost inflation indexation benefit that they get so what they do is pure difference of purchase price and sale price is the profit out there and they charge tax on that the taxes in those countries are heavy you will have to pay taxes there india you did not pay any taxes so these are certain things then there are instances when i talk about tds suppose uh, there was a transaction between india and hong kong right i i uh, sold certain services and on that the hong kong authority deducted 10% of tds i sold services worth 100 rupees they deducted 10 rupees gave 90 rupees back to me right now my 90 rupees is not taxable because i will make certain deductions with related to my expenditures to purchase of goods etc so out of the 100 rupees of services sold my profit is only 20 rupees got it on 20 rupees 30% tax bracket if i'm falling about my tax will be 6 rupees right but what is the tax that hong kong has deducted on 100 10 rupees so what happens is i will not have to pay additional tax in india because 6 rupees is what i have to pay 10 rupees is what hong kong has already deducted so in india i don't pay additional taxes but i have wasted 4 rupees also the 4 rupees which i am talking about these 4 rupees i will not get as an adjustment against my other taxes so that are gone for it so in spite of a dt double a these kind of things keep on happening so whenever you have these kind of transactions please consult your ca what best can be done how can you actually plan it out correctly right ha huh. then in case of confusion uh, and that is why i am telling ki don't end up becoming resident in both the countries ensure that you become a non resident and that is why planning your number of days knowing the law of that country where you are going or where you are coming from all that is important in case of confusion on where you are becoming resident then dt double a you has uh, an in depth in depth uh, description on how to determine the uh, taxability when i told you depending on the number of days you become a resident in india also and us also for example you can't be resident of two countries so there are ki check where you are majorly uh, residing where your family is residing where your permanent house is so there are 1 2 3 4 then there is a tie breaker rule considering that the residency calculation goes in if you are falling in those categories where this is important go to an expert and get it checked declaration of global income in the host country this is again one mistake which people generally make suppose i am going to us theek hai and we feel abhi us wale ko kaisa samjhega mera india mein koi property hai bank account hai main i will not declare what happens theek hai don't declare it there under this dt double a there is an information exchange treaty also whatever information whatever assets anything you have in india any which way is going to the us through the back end and whatever you have in us also is coming to india how far it is being used presently i will not comment on that but they have entire information with them with 0% of lacuna right so don't make a mistake of not disclosing global income please disclose it 
in case where nris pay taxes in india for uh, should look out for relief i told about the dtwa relief some issues involved then they leading and issues with regard to different tax deductions ha indexation i think we discussed about it all now coming to lrs lrs is the opposite uh, mechanism of an nri when an nri has to bring money inside take money outside that is under the 1 million scheme and things like that lrs is for a resident i am a resident in india but i want to go out for uh, a trip europe trip has become so much trendy right i need to go out for medical services i need to send my children outside india and x y z but i have a family i have my son outside india i need to send money to him for his uh, day to day affairs so all those transactions come under lrs so this scheme is basically for the resident and not for the non resident non resident can transfer the money other than lrs under the 1 million scheme for non resident 1 million scheme is there and what a resident can transfer outside india is 2 lakh 50 thousand usd again as i told you this is termed under usd but 2 lakh 50 thousand usd ka jo indian version hota hai then you convert it into whatever foreign currency you want to the equivalent should be equal to or less than 2 lakh 50 thousand usd and this money being sent outside india can include your gift loan expense on family members everything taken together should be within 2 lakh 50 thousand usd this will also include if you are doing any capital investment i i want to purchase shares outside india i am allowed i want to purchase a property outside india i am allowed i want to set up a country outside india i am allowed but the money that i am sorry now i'm sending outside india for all of these should be total of 2 lakh 50 thousand usd in a year so i can do 2 lakh 50 thousand in march and again 2 lakh 50 thousand in april right but in one financial year it should not be more than 2 lakh 50 thousand usd now this something tcs is something which is very much into talks for last 2 3 years abhi to foreign jana hai to bhi pehle mujhe 20 taka माय ट्रैवल एजेंट इज आस्किंग सौ रुपए अगर है गिव बी वन ट्वेंटी देन यू कैन गो आउट राइट व्हाई दिस हैज कम इन दिस हैज कम इन बेसिकली फॉर द रीजन मेनी टाइम्स यू डोंट सी अ पर्सन फाइलिंग आईटीआर नो इनकम बट ही इज वेरी फ्रीक्वेंटली ट्रैवलिंग टू यूरोप जापान हांगकांग सिंगापुर यूएस पैसा कहां से आया गॉड नोस राइट so to catch hold of all those people who are traveling outside india or sending money outside india my my children are uh, studying in us but i don't have any income to file an income tax return right to capture all these category of people there is this concept of tax collection at source which means whenever i'm sending any money outside india for any of the reasons specified over here the bank will collect the money which i actually need to send out plus 20% additional i mean there are different rates generally now it comes in the category of 20% so i'm talking about 20% they'll take that 20% extra and pay on my behalf on my pan to the income tax department i can claim it against my income tax return i can claim it back as a refund after filing my return discharging what taxes were required but they will collect this thing extra right so that is something which is uh, initially it came with 1% 5% and now it is 20% so it is a big burden we really need to be very careful and especially we feel chalo wapas to mil hi jane wala hai why i need to bother about it so much no i need to bother about it in cases where i am otherwise not filing any returns or i am filing a return with nil income but i am transferring transferring 50 lakh ru rupees to my son abroad for his studies contradictory you no know, if i don't have income how am i transferring so government at the back end is somewhere or the other trying to capture these people and that is why be careful if you are doing such transaction ensure that your income tax returns speak about those incomes don't let the incomes be going as nil and then you are transferring these some or you are going abroad for studies you are sending your children you are going abroad for tours don't do that now these are basically the rates suppose my child is going outside india through a education loan 
which the bank is actually giving, then it will deduct only 0.5%. That to up to 7 lakh rupees, no TCS. Beyond that, what they will deduct is 0.5%. They deposit in my PAN and I can claim it back. But the uh, percentage is very low. But suppose this again, education purpose only, my child is going out and the bank is not giving the loan. I am transferring it from my savings or my personal borrowings. Then the rate will be 0 till 7 and thereafter it will be 5%. But for any other purpose other than my education, then there is a threshold of 7 and 20% on the, for example, medical and things like that. That is 20%. If I'm going for overseas tour package, means I'm going abroad for my foreign tour, then no uh, exemption of 7 lakhs. From rupee 1 up to 7 lakh, it will be 5%. Beyond 7, the TCS will be 20%. And then there is specific person category which talks about suppose the person who is transferring this money does not have a pan at all. When I will not have a pan because I don't have income, I don't have any saving, nothing. I will not have pan. And I am transferring this money. Then my rate will be either double of the figures that are specified above but up to 20%. So where it is 5%, where it is 0.5%, will go to double the rates. Okay, there are a few questions which NRIs keep on asking, which I have just jotted down. Can an NRI keep or continue his PF? Yes, he can. Suppose he's going on, he's become an NRI, he need not immediately close his PF. But at the end of 15 years, he's still an NRI. He cannot renew it. You know, for, for five years, he can keep on renewing the FPF accounts. He will not be able to renew it. He'll have to close it after the 15 years of 15 years or the 20 years, wherever you are. Can he continue his bank accounts? No, he should convert it into an NRO or an NRE account within six months from becoming an NRI. So under FEMA, if I talk about becoming an NRI immediately on the day when I'm going out, I need to convert my regular bank account in an NRO or an NRE account within six months. Of that. The remittance of capital assets outside India. Suppose I had a property which I sold over here. Now I want to permanently settle outside India or I need money outside India for XYZ reasons. Whatever assets are there in India can be converted to cash. I mean into money and it can be remitted outside India. Maximum of 1 million USDs per year. Again, March, April, I can shift whatever. Within one financial year, 1 million USD. Salary earned from a foreign employer for services rendered in India. Means nowadays with this virtual presence, I sit in India and work for a US company. It is deemed to be earned in India. So it will be taxable in India in spite of the fact that the employer in US also might tax it and they'll deduct TDS. You take benefit of DTAA, but they will be taxed in India. So be careful on that. Loan to NRI whether it be a, from a company or a, uh, I mean, sorry, loan, loan to NRI employees of Indian companies. Yes, it is allowed. You can go ahead for having followed the FEMA guidelines which are required to be complied with. Can an NRI send money to India to his account? This is something when I'm an NRI, I want to don't want to keep money outside. And people are like, Are India bhejunga na, to mereko India mein bhi tax lagega. Received in India. It is not like that. Received in India means if my income is received in India, if my employer is paying my income in my Indian bank account, it is taxable. But if I have earned outside India, I have received it outside India, whatever spending, whatever savings is there, I remit it to India. That is, I'm just transferring my money from the left hand to the right hand. In such a case, it is not taxable. It is pure remittance of money and it is not taxable. Be clear on that aspect. Will the answer to the above be different if the money is sent to a relative or a friend? If it is sent to a relative under the blood relative ka definition, which is there under income tax, it will still not be taxable because here the taxability comes on the receiver. And so under the income tax provisions, if I receive any money from my relative, whether it be a resident or an NRI, as a loan or a gift or anything, it is not taxable. But a friend receiving it from an NRA will be taxable as a gift. So be careful on that. And that friend cannot take a loan also from an NRA. An NRA can give loan only to his family member. 
and not to an outsider unless he is doing it under the fema guidelines of ecb and other commercial borrowings if those fema uh, compliances are met borrowing is allowed but other than i would say i just gave it to you and as a loan kal utke mujhe wapas de dena is not allowed other than an nri to a family member nri giving loan to the family member when it is to be returned back the family member can give back the loan but that money has to be given to his indian bank account only it is not remittable outside india repatriable outside india so better in such cases when it is flowing from a family member to family member we always say on purpose whatever it be on paper let it be a gift son gifted to mother tomorrow mother when wants to return back the loan mother will gift it to the son gifting has no taxation loan because if i gift it and i then that person can take it abroad but if i return it as a loan repayment it cannot be taken outside india okay ha and then whether this nri loan related anything you need to read about i've put the master directions ka uh, ye also with uh, link over here you can just go through that can an nri retain his foreign assets upon returning to india yes he can retain he can retain it for lifetime that to not it is not necessary that he needs to uh, close his bank account or sell his foreign house or anything once he returns to india he can keep it for his lifetime it needs to be declared i'll come to that then taxability of the amounts kept outside india suppose some money is kept in my bank account in us it is not taxable in india unless that money is earning me any income i have kept it in a, some share and it is giving me dividends i have kept it in a fd account it is giving me interest then that income portion is taxable in india under the global taxation bracket pure money kept there asset kept there not earning any income are not taxable taxability on inward remittances of funds from an outside india shall depend upon which amounts are transferred this is like if my savings the way i told you when he is an nri and he is bringing money or he becomes a resident and is bring, bringing the money so long as it is out of his savings he is just transferring from his left hand to the right hand it will not be taxable but suppose this money has come in his bank account has an interest or as a pension fund etc and then that money is brought to india it is taxable okay taxability of pensions i told you it is taxable definitely it will be taxable in us also it is taxable in india considering the global income criteria and double taxation relief needs to be taken when some income becomes doubly taxed what is the recourse take benefit of dt aa to the extent possible reporting requirements i told you please ensure that any foreign income let it be as meager as 1 pound or 1 dollar needs to be disclose in my income tax return there is a schedule fa which is required if i have any foreign related transaction assets i cannot file itr 1 i have to ensure that i start, i file itr 2 at least or beyond that depending on my income type there is a schedule fa i need to ensure to fill that for any kind of asset any kind of foreign income got it there is no need of this fla return foreign liability and asset returns which i'll be talking about but that is not required to file the schedule fa is enough suppose i have invested in a joint venture or a wholly i am the owner of a wholly owned subsidiary outside india then there is an apr return that is required to be filed income related to investments like property purchase bank account interest etc need not be immediately remitted to india they can be kept out outside india for whatever time you want but yes if it is income declaration uh, paying tax on that in india will definitely be required even if you don't remit it income from odi investments need to be remit ha and but ha if you have an odi investment like i'm talking about a jv or a wholly owned subsidiary and they are declaring any dividend then you need to immediately bring it back to india so regular asset related income you may or may not but odi related income you have to bring it to india within a period of they are different what kind of income it is sale proceed there are three months six months nine months depending on that you'll have to bring it to india now i need to come to this fema taxation on cross border transactions we are somewhere around 1225 uh web of uh, how much time we have or we should close
हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस यू आर ऑडिबल हां इज गोइंग वी हैव 10 टू 15 मिनट्स या या वी हैव एनफ टाइम ओके ओके ग्रेट uh Thank i would you. still want if there are any suggestions if you want because see, there is a lot of which even in this one and half hour the basics also cannot be covered i have tried to be slow on where i should be and then i have started pasting up with question answers this space is enough or you need to change anything i presume i can go ahead okay see the fema and taxation cross border in case of business scenarios we talked about the nri as i told you that was more important because that will be something which we need for every part almost every participant here would be more interested in that coming to my business scenarios okay i would say the transactions can be divided in two types current account transactions and capital account transactions the examples of current account transactions are the you are importing and exporting goods and services or fixed assets for you it say it is a capital asset but no this is also a current account transaction because as such no liability or foreign liability is created you are just purchasing that asset so there is an import or an export of a goods service or a fixed asset it's a current account transaction import and export of any technology a royalty fees for technical services these are few examples which we do it on a day to day basis and these are current account transactions and fema needs to be ensured to be uh, taken care on these transactions then uh, examples of capital account transactions actually are like lending to or borrowing from a person outside india investment in india that is fdi foreign direct investment or investment outside india these are basically the capital account transactions now the fema transactions besides being capital and current uh what i was talking that these there are two ways to do it there is an automatic route wherein the government has listed down several activities where you which you can take up without taking any kind of permission from the rbi or any authority so those are my automatic route and there are transactions under the approval route wherein i need to approach the rbi now majorly if i talk about if i talk of a thumb rule the capital account transactions are transactions which are deemed to be prohibited unless the uh sebi or the rbi has uh, clearly mentioned it as permitted and current account transactions which we spoke about are deemed to be permitted you can do those transactions unless they are specifically prohibited examples i told you these are the current account type of transactions and if you just run through these you will find these are very 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 common right but we hardly realize that there can be any kind of fema involvement in this and that is why i have tried to put it up over here in this basic session also be careful any of these transaction involves fema so don't be casual about it basic compliances what are the basic compliances one is all payments of these current account transactions should be done from a formal banking channel don't do it in cash don't uh, set off against your trade receivables payables or any other kind of jvs have a proper trail of making payment for these transactions right the timelines again as i told you there are timelines if i am doing an import i need to make payment for it within 6 to 9 months if i am not doing it i need to inform the rbi formally that i couldn't pay and i need to now take permission for extension of uh, the credit that i have given if i i mean credit i give when i am doing an export and if i am doing an import i have taken a credit so in both the cases if this 6 to 9 months of time lag uh, time limit is not followed i need to make a uh, explicit application to the rbi informing them that this is the case and they'll give you an approval on extension 
then the complete transaction of funds out and the goods or services in or goods and services in and the funds out should be uh, i mean very very clear what happens is when we approach a bank we make an advance payment related paperwork we send the money but when the goods are coming in we don't close that transaction by giving all those custom related documents to the bank right what happens in turn is under the fema net bracket there is only one leg of the transaction money has gone out but goods have not come in and they can then be captured under the anti money laundering concept aml and queries can later on be raised to you it is important that as soon as the goods are coming in within 30 days i need to give my import related documentation which i have received from custom to the bank banks make a makes a note of it and the money out and goods or services in are actually then tagged together now you will say for goods i can do that how about services theek hai for services you don't have any custom documents but at least your service uh, your uh, service import or export related invoice or any kind of trail that you can provide of taking or having given that service should be given to the bank don't be lethargic in closing these transactions right now uh, 15 cacb whenever i am making any payment for any current account transaction suppose i have purchased a service see there are two three things 15 cacb if a common man who is dealing presently would know suppose i have uh, purchased some product from foreign the bank tells me give me 15 cacb it is not required 15 cacb is required only in cases where tds is applicable if i am purchasing goods if you are purchasing goods from anyone in india do you deduct tds no right so it is not there for a foreign purchase also in those cases 15 cacb is not required please tell your bank it is not required don't blindly accept whatever he tells right but yes if i am importing a service i talked about several current account like for fees for technical services franchisee uh, fts and royalty there are so many different types of services and the kinds therein tds is applicable wherever tds is applicable then even if the rate of tax uh, tds is zero 15 cacb will be required but on purchase of goods where tds is not at all applicable no uh, 15 cacb will be required okay then tds provisions shall be based on the dtwa and income tax laws only if something is taxable in india i go to the dtwa to check whether and dtwa helps me to determine whether it is taxable in india or in which uh, or in outside country if it is taxable in the india at what rate it should be some in the dtwa you will find there are some activities which are taxable in both the countries so in such a case what will be the rate of tax how much india will deduct how much us will deduct everything is been determined in the dtwa so this is something which will require expert in fact that is what business i am not concentrating on too much in the today's session is because i am just throwing ideas that these are transactions wherein fema and international taxation will creep in but answers to that will be sought only from an expert okay and no form filings like uh, for current account transactions only this payments and all those things i don't need to file any apr on an fla or any kind of other forms for making these transactions as i told you they are generally permitted then examples of capital account transactions lending and borrowing investment that is foreign direct investment means when I, indian is investing outside india odi means an outsider is investing in india basic compliances first and foremost which is something which everyone errors upon not everyone but for very frequently this is erred upon payment should be through formal banking channels after obtaining a valid uin that is unit uh, unique identification number see what is happening is i am going outside india there someone just tells me are either a business kholo you a dollar se ho jayega ek dollar meri jeb mein pada hai i picked out ye lo company banao uska incorporation related whatever payment is required to be made to the consultant i pay through my credit card 
there is a company for which i'll have to do several other compliances for its lifetime but i do i have not made it through formal banking channels i have no trail of that which is not allowed in the fema also and we end up then going for complicated uh, permissions from rbi later on right so please any investment any capital account transaction needs to go from formal banking channels please don't do it through any cash or credit card lying in your pocket strict adherence of fema guidelines whatever transaction you are doing there is a related notification and a master direction for that you need to strictly follow that form filings immediately upon entering into the transaction and other annual compliances like fcgpr that is whenever i am for, uh, issuing shares to a foreigner there is this form known as fcgpr whenever there is a transfer of shares between a resident and a non resident or a non resident to resident there is an fctrs then this is uh, apr apr is my annual performance report a resident entity being an individual partnership llp company xyz has made an overseas direct investment in a joint venture or a wholly owned subsidiary that company outside india needs to be monitored right for that this apr filing is there every year this is required to be done if not done there are consequences then there is this a foreign liability and assets for an individual you made a declaration in schedule fa for other than individuals the same type of declaration happens under this form fla so these form filings are very important please don't be lethargic on that or don't ignore those form filings because the consequences today for all this are too heavy right document exchange within stipulated time period share certificates dividends whatever paperwork is happening needs to if i have uh, invested in a country outside india i need to bring those share certificates to india i need to submit it to the bank when i paid money outside india the second leg that is share certificates needs to be submitted to bank to ensure that both the legs are completed so every time there is a money out or in ensure that the second leg is completed and repatriation of incomes or sale proceeds under lrs except for odi which i talked about that is i am setting up a joint venture or a wos which actually comes under this uh, category that is why except for that no other money needs to be brought to india immediately but under the odi category capital account transactions the repatriations of the income the sale pro proceeds of the purchase of the properties and all that need to come to india common cautions for a capital account transaction ensure that you don't deal with res uh, restricted countries pakistan bangladesh sri lanka we have a list of x number of uh, restricted countries with whom if you need to transact you have to do it through approval route only not through automatic route second not transacting through credit cards or cash when you are on visit to that country please don't do it please transfer the money from india through normal banking channels however costly it is please investor or investee entity should not be rbi caution list if i am an investor want to uh, invest in somewhere outside india or someone outside india needs to invest in my company partnership llp neither i nor the foreign entity should be in a restriction or under a caution list now this is basic which i needed to cover and had a part of my presentation i'll be open to any kind of questions that you will like to post hello yeah yeah thank you ma'am for the presentation and explaining topic in simplifying way so now i request all the participants and delegates if you have any questions you can feel free to ask directly to the ma'am or you can put your questions into chat box also and if at all later on if you all have any questions my whatsapp number and uh, email address is there on the screen you may note it down uh, i'll be happy if you all can just drop in your messages later on also as per my time schedule i shall revert back to your questions
repeat if anyone have any questions you can unmute yourself and ask directly to the ma'am or you can put your questions in the chat box yes dr sundar you had any query yeah. Uh, very good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Ms. Amira Joshia. Uh, yeah, within the given time, you have covered uh, quite a lot. I could see I'm an engineer, not a CA, but I can see there is a lot of, it's quite complicated, and uh, one has to know that uh, there are requirements uh, and guidelines, whatever given, by income tax and uh, our RBI and all those things has to be followed to avoid any consequences that may cost them a hell of a lot of money. Uh, my question, thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation and very clear what you are speaking, speaking about it. Thank you, sir. And you could cover the businesses as well as the individual. And one thing I was, uh, you told, there's only 30% comes from the corporate and 70% remittance comes through NRI. Is it true? Sorry, sir? You told, I think, that from the NRI, uh, remittances are almost uh, 70% and the corporate is only 30%. Is it true? No, 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 sir. That was interpreted wrongly. I was saying that major, if I talk about the interest, from the participant point, as an individual, I'll be in almost 70-80% bracket of the population who okay, need to okay. know the individual related uh, international taxation provisions. Direct, the business direct. category people here would be comparatively in just 20-30%. to 30%, So I concentrated more on the individual category. That's, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I misinterpreted. Thank okay. you. No <laughs> issues, sir. My question is now, basic question like if company is registered in India hmm. and they have some branches outside India, yes, but uh, those branches are uh, means uh, local companies only. Okay. In African countries or uh, Asian countries. In that case, how is the taxation? See, in such cases, what will happen is those uh, companies will have to discharge their respective taxes there only because they are individual people out there, right? But there is a relation which exists between those branches or a company. I would say it is a wholly owned subsidiary or a JV. Let us not talk about a branch because if you say they are a separate company, they will either be my joint venture wherein I am a part owner and there will be someone else who is a part owner or there will be a wholly owned subsidiary. Means the entire owner is me. Right? So that relationship of a parent and a child exists. Considering that if there are any transactions between these companies, then they will be checked on whether they have happened as an independent person at arm's length price. Those kind of checkings will happen. But those profits will not be taxed in India unless it is proved that those entities are factually run from India only. <laughs> from a virtual presence, everything is handled from India. It is only that it is registered out there. So what we called as POEM, place of effective management. If the yes. place of effective management ends up to be India, then definitely that taxes will also be or have to be, uh, those profits will have to be offered in India for taxes. But if that cannot be proved, if it is proved that they are separate companies, there are people who are running that company, there are employees over there, it is an independent entity, then it will not be taxed in India. Yeah, because those are independent companies only. Yes. yes. But uh, then uh, they have license from India to operate uh, certain uh, protocols. Ha, certain so, those lic ha, so in that case is when I'm giving them license, I should be getting some money, that a consideration in return for that. Yeah. So that is covered under the transfer pricing provisions. Yeah. Then yes. they are... Uh, covered under the bilateral treaty between two countries. Yes. So yes. they are paying all the tax and everything there. But uh, they can bring the money, which is not taxable here. 
I suppose. Haan, they can bring the money depending on suppose see now on what basis you will bring over here. Either you will have to declare a dividend out there for the parent company, and then the parent company brings money here. On what basis that money is coming to India? That is important. Either it is coming as a consideration for the license, so the income is being any which way generated in India, or it is being being brought in as a dividend. It is a technical fee. It is a royalty. So that. i need to identify how i am bringing the money to india in which category and which category will attract minimum taxation thank you thank you ms meera uh, you have good My knowledge pleasure. and uh, really i appreciate thank you sir your uh, um, it's uh, so much of knowledge about this payment thank you thank you very much thank i really much, liked it very much thanks thanks a lot my pleasure so, my pleasure thank you anyone have any question so ma'am i think there is no more questions so can we move ahead ma'am yes then i've done from my end okay yes thank you very much for giving me this opportunity i hope i have not complicated the thoughts of the participants rather than actually uh, giving them good answers to their questions mm -hmm. and uh, i'll be open to answering questions even when they are received it offline okay ma'am thank okay, you ma thank you very much weber thank you sundar sir for giving me this opportunity thank you ma'am so our next session is on 30 march it shall be taken by mr bupesh sud on ISO 42001-2023 Artificial Intelligence Management. ICS is pleased to provide you all its research and development, integrated management system (QMS, CMS, and OHSS). Excellence in education management. ISO made easy in Gujarati, Marathi, Telugu, and Hindi. For reading any of the above books, please contact me, Shushma Kindalkar, on the given contact details. Feedback form. Please register on www. sadgunsan. org and go in your login and give your valued feedback to us. And we also have our official YouTube channel. You can also visit that channel. You may find all our recorded sessions on our official YouTube channel. Thank you for the being part of Sadgunsan. Now it's time to officially close the session. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.